Good morning. It's Thursday, March 31st at 10 a.m. Um, we are in the second floor media room of City Hall. My name is Joan Jennings. I am the chair of the Public Art Committee, and we're here for a uh, special workshop this morning. Diane, will you call the roll? Lucienne Robinson? Here. William Mills? Here. Joan Jennings? Here. David Salo? Robert Stackhouse? Here. Deborah Hennessy? Okay. Um, we have a very special guest speaker this morning, Robin Nye, Manager of Arts and Cultural Affairs for Tampa. Her very impressive biography um, has been provided uh, us by the ever-efficient Diane. And um, we are going to be tapping into her considerable knowledge and expertise with some questions we prepared for her about uh, issues concerning public art. Uh, Robin, are you there? Good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We'll turn it over to you, Robin. Okay, doke. Th thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I, what I have done as I have uh, printed out your questions and I put together some images um, that kind of at the same time give you kind of the history of our program and how we built what we built and, and at the same time kind of slide in to answer your questions um, regarding funding and how we can do that. So if I am, um, I, I have no objections to interruptions or you can wait to questions at the end, uh, whatever is uh, preferred by your chairman and, and your committee. So um, I'm happy to do um, how, however it works best, um, but I will go ahead and, and get started with that. Um, so what, what I have done again is, is just um, in regards to uh, mission and vision, these are the things that we just kind of keep in the, in the forefront. And because they're not part of our ordinance, it's easy for us to update them to, and to have them as um, relevant and adjust for whatever, for instance, our administration uh, might seem as, as their initiatives for the um, for that mayor's term. We are a strong mayor form of government, so a lot of what I do kind of tucks up under um, whatever those initiatives are. So you see the vision up there, and, and essentially, and, and I've played with other ways of, of expression of, of expressing it with our public art committee, and, and essentially, we just want people to want us. We want to be um, seen and, and deemed essential. So it's really working in our messaging and how we do that. As you'll see, some of the things also is that we have broken up into, um, because our ordinance allows us to work within it and do various types of programming. And that's actually what makes us really, really unique is that we've been able to create programs that work within the ordinance. And um, all of those programs, you can see that the criteria for that is, is below there where it says maintains artistic excellence. It's, it's free, accessible, uh, has wide appeal and includes educational components. And this also allows me to um, use it essentially as a discursive device when somebody complains, because everybody does, right? About something every once in a while. And you just say, well, you know, we hope to have something for everyone. So we, if you don't like that, that's okay. But we do hope that there are things that you do like and that can speak to you. So it really does allow us to respond um, and, and to have it out there. So it, it helps when to deal with complaints. The other thing, I, again, um, just to give you a sense of where we are, the city of Tampa likes to run really lean. And um, the national average was um, is, is still a dollar per person in terms of like how much it is spent per on artwork. That is, of course, paltry and low. But um, we have one of the reasons we can do this is because I've learned to uh, to leverage and to work with other entities and agencies, and if at all possible, spend their money. You know, uh, so and the, the national here up there, I. Uh, gave you just kind of a list about where certain programs are um, nationally. There's about 800 programs in there. And all of these, now I will say it's taken years to get there, but we have um, policies for everything that is on there now. So 
Uh, we do have a public and private development ordinance. Um, we do have a donations policy. All of these things are really, really critical. And the nice thing about them being policy, which I think um, you guys have some questions that pertain to, to some of these things and, and unsolicited artist requests and so on. The great things is when they are policy and not necessarily part of the ordinance, then that means that they can be um, a little bit revised. So if they're just guidelines, you can go back you, and uh, adjust them when they're no longer relevant or they need to be tweaked or, or whatever that case is. Um, now, where these the uh, public art programs sit for the most part is uh, they're all over the place. As you can see there, um, the majority are in Department of Arts and Cultural Affairs. You know, if you're like um, the city of Tampa, we've been in, in all these places. So uh, a lot of administrations and such don't necessarily know where and what to put or where to put these departments. Um, if there is a Department of Arts and Cultural Affairs, I think it's stronger when they're tucked up under that because they do kind of speak the same language and have support, but that's not always the case. Um, and, and also the, the graph on your, um, on the right, I think probably gives you a good sense. Now, the, it's real tough on the funding side. You can see I have lots of provisos there with the, um, with the asterisks and the stars, what means, um, and it's, you know, because some of our, uh, these funding sources are also granting agencies. But for the most part, we have um, the largest collection in the state because, and, and I'm pulling, I'm saying that because we are, um, a city of Orlando counts the objects in their museum as part of that. And th that collection is really broad. It's, it's a lot of things. It's photography, it's animation, it's sculpture, it's outdoor things. When I first came to the city and I kind of long in the tooth here, I've been here since, um, well, 23 years now, there were 85 objects in the collection and now there's um, over 800. And our, uh, we had an appraisal done a conservation and an, and an appraisal came in and, and looked at the collection and our value is about 21 million or 20 between 20 and 21 million is the value of our collection right now. Um, so I want to just really start with um, showing you because the, the, the percent for art projects and I don't know how much Tarpon Springs is building right now, but they are um, a great opportunity to build internal relationships um, and how these are just three projects that are um, examples and that I really kind of wanted to share about building advocacy so that basically you can get more money and perhaps more staff if you need it to do more things. Um, so all of our uh, projects when I got here, there were very few, I'm trying to think if there were any, well, there was one that I can remember that had, uh, that was integrated into the site and integrated into the architecture of the of the location. Most of them were objects that were purchased either after or commissioned afterwards and not really connected to um, the site or the space. And one thing that the first thing I did was start to build internal relationships and pull in um, whoever the entity or the agency was, for instance, the park bench on your left and, and the um, mural in the middle, the tile mural, that, that's by, uh, by local artist Bruce Marsh. What I did is bring, brought in uh, the parks department and have them part of it. And I really emulated the state's um, ordinance and how they had, had their committees set up. So I, I uh, mirrored that and um, was able to get the architects um, in, in the city to just like, hey, can you lower the floor half an inch so that, or a quarter inch, so that we can do a terrazzo floor there. And I got that into the um, contract, got that into the design before it was bid. And that just made a huge difference. So it was able to leverage that. And then what I did, particularly, um, I remember well for the um, mural at the, in the middle at a pool, is I wrote an article and I sent it to Landscape Architecture Magazine. They printed it. Um, and then I gave it to the parks department and then, then I had a friend for life, you know, because it, 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 they not only saw it, but they looked good and it was really, we were off to good things. They did the same things for, uh, with public works when we did a project for them as, as then get them press and showed what the things that they could do. Um, another program then that we started because 
these capital projects and working with the percent for art, they are number one, they're slow. And I know you all know that. Um, and there's a very, there's, I won't say there's a limited audience, but there's a specific audience. And what that often means is that a lot of the people that you're trying to get support and get advocacy from, they will never see it. Not to mention in some cases, if you have a project and these can be, this, this actually will lean quite well to some of your questions about temporary artworks and installations because the same kind of strategy applies. What I did is I thought, well, you know, there's a really strong pool of photographers in the uh, region. So let's do a call for photographers. Let's have a photographer laureate program. And again, I didn't invent, reinvent the wheel. I copied what uh, the NEA did. They had a program to this and so did another um, another or organization that is escaping me at the moment uh, um, had one anyway. Uh, so I just kind of st structured it very similar to that. And then all, because we were also, the only thing we had in the city in regards to portable works were um, a very nice, but relatively small collection of artworks from Graphic Studio that the Public Art had, Committee had purchased um, some years before. And that just didn't get us very far. So if I commissioned photographers that were all artists and I put that in council chambers, then council chambers, and to this day now for over 20 years, council chambers has always had um, some artwork by some of our artists in their uh, spaces. So, so it just kind of gets those objects in front of them so that they can see what, what, uh, what they do. Um, that also, and again, I know you're not talking about, but this also will parlay into what you're, questions were in regards to um, temporary installations and such. Um, we started Lights on Tampa basically with a, a, a vision. Again, it goes back because we believe strongly that a community can recognize if you really high quality art, if it's big and you stick it in their face. <laughs> And so that's what I basically was trying to do here with a team that we all pulled together with the same vision. And it's like, let's make something really big and spectacular and let people see what art in the public realm can do. Um, this, these images here from Lights On are from 2015, but we initially did it in 2006 and you can see the other dates there uh, that we've done this. It is a, it really pushes our resources, but what it has done is it has established a, um, one, an expectation within the community. It's established some quality, it's inspired developers. And if we had not done Lights On in 2006, we would not be uh, tasked with um, lighting the bridges in downtown Tampa. Now, to date, I've lit six bridges in downtown Tampa. Um, five of them were for the uh, RNC in 2012. The funding for this, to, to, let's back up to that for just a minute. The funding, all that came out of the arts budget was the, design, the lighting design fee of the artist. The rest of it um, came from private donations that the mayor actually requested. So we got funding from TICO and then some um, additional dollars from some other sponsors. And because again, it was a mayoral initiative, he really did act, this was uh, Mayor Buckhorn, really did kind of act like a linebacker and, and kind of clear the way for us um, in a lot of that. And it, the other thing also, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mention earlier to go back on all this funding is that one thing we, I did early, um, like in the first couple of years of our founding, and it wasn't me, I have to, I, I need to give proper credit. It was to a public art committee member who was an attorney who um, set up for us our own separate nonprofit. So we have a 501c3 that's Friends of Tampa Public Art. We have a separate board in which the arts, there's a public art committee member who sits on the board always, and it just really keeps communication. And, and the thing is most everybody on our arts, uh, on the board of Friends of Tampa Public Art are former public art committee members because they're just really good members that we don't wanna let go and they know our process and they know what we're doing and they've just become part of our team. Um, and this is our most recent lights on installation, which turned into a, a basically a gateway. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. We just kicked it off right before the Super Bowl. Um, last year. That's when the Bucks won, right? Yeah. 
uh, and you can see the before and after shots. And these before and after shots, I have to tell you, I do that for everything. So again, it just really is about advocacy and educating and building awareness. So, um, so what that has done also is that this is on the, the Water Street. We do work on, on several partnerships. These are um, a couple of projects. The top three are all private developers of which we played a key role in um, the artist selection. And on the bottom is Andrea Poli. Uh, uh, she was also one of the installations of Lights On in 2021. So uh, again, all of these things work within the ordinance. We just kind of creatively figured out, and this was a tip somebody gave me decades ago and I've never forgotten it, is that you work, you learn the inner documents of your city. You learn how to work within the ordinance, how to le learn to work within the inner workings of um, the documents within the city so that you can just um, do a lot uh, that way. And the funding, as I mentioned, is yes, some of it is um, city, but I would say it, 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 for, for lights on, not all of them, because some of them, the economy tanked and our partners, we lost our partners and that of course, Keeps it, a, keeps it in flux. But um, for the most part, OPM, by the way, stands for other people's money, which is mm -hmm. um, something that we, we just really try to do as much as possible because we just don't have a lot of resources. Um, and sometimes other people's money can be another department's money. So the mayor, this again was a mayoral request from Mayor Buckhorn, and he liked big things. So he um, called and said, you know, Robin, I want you to paint the Poe garage. So um, this, the, the, doing the garage, that's a huge task. So how we leveraged with that is that the total cost for the project was $400,000, but the artist contract, the artist fee was $100,000. And how we did that is that we coordinated with the parking division and they came in and primed the whole garage. And we were, and the artists then of course were in, um, they gave the painting, I mean, excuse me, the um, parking department, what primer it should be because there's very, you know, you need to be sensitive to what type of paint is going to um, work because you don't want it to fade within a year at that, at that cost and expense. And so they used that paint, which was more expensive, but it really was a good gripper for the paint so that it was, um, it, it's lasted, it hasn't faded, it still looks great. And this is, gosh, um, at least eight or nine years old now. Um, and again, that's just a way of kind of working within. So the, the it, in many cases, the uh, parking department, they had painted one section you know, two or three days before, let it dry, and then the artist came in right afterwards and, and worked with that. So um, it, it is just kind of creative coordination. Again, another before and after shot. This uh, is under the river walk, and the Tampa River Walk um, is is one that's kind of uh, cobbled together in terms of its funding. This particular one was funded by a state grant. Again, not our money, but. Um, we kind of had the concept and I got in early. That's the thing is that there was a meeting I remember and I, I have a, another image I think on the next slide. Let me show you this. Here's another before shot. The image on your left is what the landscape architect had um, or, or the architect had proposed for the site. So this is on the river walk. It's under I-275. Um, so it's an, an underpass. And we, of course, had to then work very closely with FDOT on everything. And I just thought that looked really um, like a kind of uh, depressing. <laughs> I mean, it, it looks so institutional for it to be a, um, a river walk. And it's really actually, if you've been there, it's a nice space. There's a breeze. It's, um, it's the coolest spot on a hot day, of course. So it really could be a respite and just needed to have a little kind of a different approach to it. So what I proposed instead of, because they had suggested, well, why don't you hang banners on these um, metal grates? And what I did here, th these are the metal grates that they were talking about. And so it's like, okay, so you can, this is a, an artist team out of, uh, I believe they're out, I know they're out of Texas, but I think it's Austin. And so this is connected completely um, 
you know, like a bifurcated fan basically connected to it. Here they had proposed like um, banners, which I think are really kind of awful because then they, they sag and they don't look great and they have all kinds of issues. And then if, they, if that doesn't look good, then we don't look good. And then the artist gets upset and or, we, or people try to steal it or it's graffiti. We've worked with all those kind of conditions. And so it, it's kind of like, well, you know, you have glass in between at, at transit stops, so there is safety glass. So what if we did something with the um, with an artist to kind of do these this safety glass? So you still have the same effect, but you get um, a lot more effect with the light coming through. And it really is an incredible space. It's just the artist artist did an amazing job. She was terrific. And um, the other thing about this I want to mention with the artist is that it pushed her too, which was really great. So a lot of our artists sometimes we will challenge them because they have the right idea. We think they have the right aesthetic, but it's not necessarily in the material or to the scale that we think is, you know, is needed for the site. So we'll kind of ask them if they're open to uh, a little bit of a challenge. Do they want to look at the site a little differently? Can we look at materials? Do they want to experiment with this? Can we help them somehow? And um, it's kind of fun to really help an artist uh, figure it out and just see some amazing things happen. Now, uh, Perry Harvey Park is a, a park that uh, is in historic uh, African-American neighborhood, actually, that was kind of, uh, well, not kind of, it was wiped out in, uh, with the interstate. And this is a, um, an instance where the percent for art ordinance, as you can see, generated $75,000. And the total artwork, though, in the park is $750,000. Now, this was a real turning point for us as a program. Uh, I did do an NEA grant and we got $100,000 on an NEA grant and that went to, that funded one artist project. The others though, what was really interesting about this is that because we had built such a nice relationship for, um, uh, with the parks department and the mayor knew we could deliver that a line item was put in, um, in the budget for over $600,000 for artwork. And that made all the difference. And so what, and again, it really gets creative in regards to how you get more for little out of, out of purse is in this case, we paid that 75 all went to artist design fees. We got them all up and running, got them started, got through contracts, made their initial payment. And then the subsequent levels of it, they were under the contractor. So it was just a very kind of a different way of handling a project. Um, for us, and it actually in many ways has become the norm. Um, Julian B. Lane Park is another one in which there's over a million dollars in artwork in the project, but the 200,000, which is what our cap is, um, again, it paid for all the design fees, got them up and running, got them started, got through the contract. So, so the contractor then, it was just all tucked up and they knew exactly what their services were and what they were gonna do. Um, now let's let's back off from that because I know that's a really that's a lot to do and that's 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 I kind of gave you the big swoop of how we got to these big projects, but I want to talk about and, and kind of share with you because I think some of you were asking about smaller projects and community projects and some of these can be done in a very um, simple way, although it, it it's never as easy as it looks when it comes to logistics to make sure that you get the reach that you want. Um, Mayor Castor wanted to reconvene uh, or restart the uh, photo laureate, excuse me, I'm sorry, the poet laureate uh, program. But what we did is the poet laureate programs typically within the state are um, uh, free. They artists, you know, they don't get paid and um, they kind of write when they're inspired to or when they're asked to. And what we wanted to do here was actually get the um, poet laureate or the words, and I, and I renamed it to wordsmiths because I think if you could engage and do a little bit more with that. So uh, engage with a wordsmith to engage the community. And that was has been actually a lot of fun. Um, it, the timing was good in the sense that we also, during COVID when there was lockdown, uh, we released uh, haiku from home and just encourage people to you know, write us. We had over 500 submissions uh, with people writing 
their haikus and thoughts and we put them on the um, on the website and of course everybody wants you to make you know cards out of them and stuff but that's not uh, it's not what we're here for and um, so the the other thing that we did is this little uh, poetry post we call it it's made by a local artist Eileen Goldenberg and uh, we move it around to community centers and we ask you know people there to put their poetry in there put their thoughts and it's kind of like a suggestion box and it's amazing what you what you get some of them are incredibly sweet some of them are really funny um, and it's just been a uh, rewarding, if not time consuming thing to do. Also during the pandemic, we had an artist, we commissioned an artist to make uh, a series of snipe signs uh, that, that we then put out everywhere. We, we sent them to our sister departments and they, Parks Department for instance, uh, there were a series of like three or four designs the artist did. and. Um, then we just placed them everywhere during the uh, during the lockdown, and that was again a nice a nice good feel. And um, I don't know that people necessarily know who did that, and it doesn't really matter because it was effective, and certainly the administration knows. But there are ways like that that you can do kind of low cost, high visibility things that will raise visibility of your program. Some of our community engaged projects, I mean, everybody, every neighborhood loves murals. We ourselves do not necessarily have a mural program. We have done a lot of them. We, I find that um, murals, because they are community favorites, if we give people the tools to do them on their own, they kind of happen on their own, especially in a lot of um, communities where there are a lot of artists, they'll, they'll just roll with it. I mean, they'll just, you know, they don't need us, in other words. Um, this particular one, it was a, one that actually did have a lot of um, political charge for us. So it did take a lot of time. The community, and there, there was a community meeting there. The artists were great. Um, the community, I have to tell you, I really felt behaved badly. They like yelled at the artists and they did things that, um, it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't cool. It's not cool to yell at artists. And so um, we, it was a little bumpy. I, I, but but in the end, I will say they the community loves it. The artists, again, I just have to say thumbs up to them. They did a great job. Um, and there you see on the bottom uh, in inner one, the smaller photo, that's the mayor there. Uh, we drove by and meet and greet. And the community uses it a lot. So it's a very, very good active space. But it was, um, you know, we, we st still learn lessons. Uh, another example of a community partnership, we, um, uh, the junior league came to me and they wanted to do a mural for human trafficking. Uh, and they, everybody wants it downtown. It's like, well, I really don't have a wall downtown. We, I don't keep an inventory of walls, but in this particular case, this, this wall was part of a um, parking, temporary parking facility that the Meridian Hotel was using at the, um, at the time. So I asked them if we could use the wall. They said, yes. Uh, Junior League paid the artist. I found the artist for them. Junior League paid the artist so we didn't have to worry about the contract, didn't have to worry about um, insurance and all the contracts that sometimes, I mean, cities by their process have to do all these particular safety measures that are make things go a little slower, but of course it's safety and we have to do that. But in this particular case, the artist didn't have to go through those hoops. So um, it, it, this particular location is right next to the Greyhound bus station. We talked to Greyhound bus. And then the one that, that is there is actually uh, that you see on the screen is a heart bus. Mm -hmm. So we paid, and, and that came out of my budget actually, is to pay for the reproduction of these um, so, uh, so in, in, on the buses and in other media stations. We also did uh, bus stops as well with another artist. And again, that was a kind of a different type of a partnership. And we would like to do more partnerships with people of social justice um, content. Um, it just is gonna, it just has to take a, take a while. And this one um, also is, get, we get into the unsolicited proposals and temporary installations and gifts, every single one is different. So if you um, don't have a policy, again, I, I would go back to kind of drafting out uh, what kind of policies you would like to have. Um, 
the unsolicited proposal, the, that was an artwork, the one on your left, somebody wanted to put that on the river walk. And in the enthusiasm of the people who were giving the gift, they um, kind of accepted it, but it's like, that's, we, we I have, I really pushed against, pushed back because it, it will not main, it will not be maintained. I mean, what you see there is the foundation on, on, a, on a, so it, it just was not meant for um, our harsh environment on the river walk. So it just would not, it would not be a good fit. It would come back and um, I think be a real headache for everybody. Uh, in regards to, it would just look bad really quickly too, because the paint was, and all of those things you just kind of go through on any type of a gift policy is how does that work and why and that kind of thing. Um, the image in the center, again, a separate nonprofit really pushed to have this artwork on the curb and and they moved it around and poorly installed it. Um, they, then they left it there for five years because we didn't have the tools to make them move it and it looked bad and it was just really frustrating. But And now we, what we did is we, we changed, uh, we, we developed a policy um, for citizens requested art placement and um, they can apply for the permit. We work with our permitting department to make sure that you know, we've got them locked in that yes, do it. But when it's lived its life and it's done, it needs to go because then everybody will think that's ours and we can't have anything that doesn't look good out there. Um, you know, our reputation is all we've got, basically. So that that's a big um, concern. And of course, I have a great public art committee. So they are um, really are such good advocates to push up to the administration and say what the needs are, or what they're thinking or what their concerns are. Um, for things like that, where if there's lesser quality or in, in any of those kind of things. The um, artwork on your right is a beautiful bench that was actually a, um, it was a gift to the city and it, it worked out really well. The um, weird thing is that it was uh, the Arts Council, which is not us, but the Arts Council of Hillsborough County gave a grant to the artist to do an artwork in a city park. And it's like, well, you know what? They don't have anything to do with city parks. So it was kind of a, uh, a little frustrating at that point because they didn't include what the foundation cost would be or um, the placement or the lighting or any of these other kind of issues. So that kind of left us on the hook a little bit, um, but it worked out all in the end. And the artist, of course, did a beautiful job. Um, uh, going back on the, uh, some of our other partners, and it, it, what's really important is that for the philosophy of a lot of our projects, what we do is we just say sight lines are not property lines. So that's why in some cases, in special cases, we will work with a developer on, on private property, on their property, if it's to the benefit of the community as a whole, if it's got high visibility, if it... Uh, is it going to be of high quality if they're going to work with us and if it's going to do their lighting and everything's going to be done to the um, standards, then um, we absolutely will entertain the idea. And in this case, uh, because we were really, the housing authority had a lot of locations and properties. So in this case, we contributed some funding. We managed the call to artists. And you can see there that we also did the manage the meetings and manage the artist contract. Um, that worked out really well. Everybody's, I mean, and also because it's faced our park and we wanted to make sure that whatever was, um, the, the content and such was complimentary. So it was really, it made sense for us to merge or blend committees on this particular case, which is what we did. Um, also on some other, cultivating some partnerships uh, can take a while. Um, we have worked a number of uh, projects with uh, FDOT, and I will be upfront and honest and say, I'm not crazy about all of them. I don't think that they have been necessarily as successful as they could have been. And that's because you just have to work through in, um, a lot of people's process. The um, medallions that you see, those, those are plaster cast medallions um, that are actually, they were clay formed and then they um, made molds and pulled the molds into the, um, uh, spandrels or the corner panels of the interstate. And these were during the I-4 expansion project. Uh, the artist, I, um, I found he's actually was a toy maker 
and he knew how to cast, um, make molds and cast them. So he was great and F dot loved him. So um, that was our first project together. And then we worked on a couple of others. Uh, the in inlay on the sidewalk on the right is with James Tokley, or he was poet laureate at the time. Uh, this marks a historic site, an African-American heritage site, or it's not, it's not designated a heritage site, but, um, and then the one on the left, I'm not crazy about, but it was, the community loved it. The artist was terrific. Um, I just think it looks kind of funny on the wall. And this is with um, F. Dot, and again, it's the banners, and I will not do a banner again, but um, it, it, it's what we had to do in this particular case. Uh, and these partnerships, cultivation has uh, really excelled to now we are doing much bigger projects with FDOT. And that includes um, the, the one on your left is under a, a underpass on Hillsborough Avenue. The, this is actually not, it's a work in progress. You just see the rendering there. And that's going to be like a mural that's 150 feet long by 14 or 15 feet high. And also working with them on a, a gateway uh, with a call to artists for this has not gone out yet, but it has come a long, long way. So this is where, for instance, we will pay with our agreement will be with FDOT is that we will pay for the design and we will get it through engineering and then they will build it. And they've earmarked something like, um, and I probably shouldn't be, I don't want to com commit to it, but I mean, around a little over a million dollars, I think is what they've committed to construction of this. So why wouldn't we work as it because it for for an entry gateway and for something that's going to be um, uh, you know a real signature for the city? Why wouldn't we go through, do that? You know, so that's kind of the things that uh, we're looking at, and that's pretty much it. I do have um, I, I did want to ask if you have any questions. There is uh, one last slide that I have here because this is my recent project. Is um, now we're also doing a project for the uh, Tampa Convention Center. And again, I'm going back to our budget department and asking for additional dollars because our ordinance, there isn't enough by what the ordinance does. Our ordinance, uh, as I mentioned, the cap is $200,000 and I'm working with legal right now to get that cap bumped up a bit. That's the same cap it's been since 1985. And if you look at a, um, one of those budget calculators, that $200,000 in 1985 is worth $511,000 now. So I think we're justified to try to move that up a little, but we have tried everything in regards to, um, or at least what we know, uh, we haven't probably tried everything, but um, ways to partner and, and ways to leverage and ways to figure out how we can do more with what resources we have. Um, and that's that's pretty much all I've got. So uh, any questions? Well, before we go to questions, I'd really like to thank you, Robin. This was very enlightening in a lot of very many ways. And we really thank you for your time and expertise in talking to us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank so you. It's, it's, it's highly appreciated. I, I have um, uh, a quick question about the underpass project. Mm -hmm. Was there any... Mm -hmm. Uh, was there any concerns about uh, vandalism or damage, you know, the glass, safety glass panels? Oh, yeah, I, oh, absolutely there was. And it's, it's really funny, you know, the first um, month, one of the panels was broken. And what I think that was, it was not anything because I was standing there one time. It was something that fell off the road above it and came down and broke it. So it wasn't out of uh, out of vandalism. For the most part, if it's really and the lighting there also was really up too. So there, it's it's um, really bright in the evening. And so there, yes, there is a, a little, but I would say overall of um, our vandalism. Really, God, I can only think of like one in the past ten years. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Lucy Ann, uh, thank you again. Um, 
I did have one minor detail question. I think it was on the river walk. There were metal mesh panels yes. that yes. that then had artwork applied to them. What was the medium for the artwork? It was sort of watery, not that um, the one prior that one? there. That oh, one? Yeah, that's glass, that's safety glass. That's the same thing that you'll glass. see in subways, yeah. So it didn't, it wouldn't shatter. And, and we had, again, so much of it, you're, you know, it feels like you're reinventing the wheel all the time. At least I feel that way because you, you we had to figure out how to, how it was going to be held. Um, and, but the thing is, is that other people have done that. You just have to find the right um, sub for the artist to work with. Bill? Yeah, again, very helpful uh, presentation. I think you answered it, but if you could just kind of elaborate a little bit, you know, one of the problems we have is, is the location of, of in-kind uh, art uh, with the way the ordinance is written. And it sounded as though you used that geographic location um, to be approved through permitting. Is that correct? Yeah, now for yeah, um, no, temporary artwork, are you talking about artwork that is um, from, a temporary, I mean, from another artist, from another group? Well, this would be artwork that uh, um, instead of making a contribution mm. uh, based upon the ordinance, uh, they would do an in-kind um, piece of artwork that would be, and what we found or, or what we're finding is they're wanting to place it on their developed area or their, their property. Yeah. Um, and some of it has somewhat limited exposure to that, you know, the public will actually get to, to see it. Right. But we don't have any provisions in the ordinance, ordinance at this point to, you know, uh, kind of adjust that a little bit. And it sounds as, sounds as though you use the permitting process to help with that. Um, well, yes and no. And the reason I'm saying that it, now, if that's for, um, or use the permitting process through with, with the private groups, you know, separate nonprofits and people who wanted to have temporary installations um, outside of the area. Uh, but with developers, now public art and private development, is that to confirm that's what you're talking about, right? Yes. Okay. Public art and private development, I will say I have worked with that. My first boss actually in Chicago was a developer and um, he had a very, it's a different world. <laughs> and and um, the developers here, our, our ordinance, first of all, is not good. Our public art and private development ordinance, it's tucked up in the, in the land use ordinance and it's poorly written. And I used to struggle with them all the time on the very topics that you're talking about because it was, they don't wanna do it, number one, or they'll do it late, number two. Um, and it's not as good as you would do yourself because they're going to be out of there and they're going to flip it over or, 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 you know, flip it and sell it or if it's a condo or whatever. So I really just found that to be such a headache. Um, what ended up happening is that we have changed our ordinance to so that for the public art and private development portion of it so that it's fee based. They just give us the money and let us figure out what we're gonna do with it. We will do something because it's restricted to be within the region in which those funds were generated. So we will work with them maybe, but I mean, if, if you tell them something and in this particular case is a good example of what I did with one developer is, um, I just told him it's fee-based, he wanted to have a say in it. And I said, well, you don't, you, one, you don't have to, I mean, it's not required that you do that. We don't have to let you have a say in it. And it's not to say that you want to be unfriendly because you do and you want to work with them and cultivate them. But, you know, I also will say something which is true in this case. I said, well, we may like that bridge that's adjacent to his property. That makes him look a lot better in their property than, and, it, it, and one, we can maintain it. We can get to it. Public can see it. It just meets the criteria that our program has better than letting the developer do it. It's real hard when the developer and has controls that portion of it. Yeah. Robert? 
Oh, just continuing that a little bit, I thank you, Robin, for this presentation. It's uh, very impressive to see all that you've done in Tampa. And uh, one thing I just want to remark about one of the uh, uh, statements you had on here is that uh, uh, sight lines are not always property lines. I, I really like that. The, the impact of art it goes beyond uh, a person, you know, a, a private area, which can apply to some things we're dealing with here. But um, what, what I'm really impressed about is, is how you've um, taken uh, projects and have sort of a, a, a budget, a, a, a ceiling budget, and yet you're able to get other people's money. <laughs> and, and the OPM is one of the most exciting things about it, especially, especially what's impressive is you can get uh, other people's money before the building is built, like you, you've uh, talked about a little bit. And uh, how do you go about uh, going beyond your, your spending ceiling and being able to double, triple the, the budget for a project, which obviously ends with really incredible results when you do that? <laughs> Yeah, um, a lot of it, I'll do a lot of homework on my, I mean, find examples, you know, and, and vision build with the, the developers or, or whomever and just kind of get them excited about what it can be. I mean, so much of what I do personally, I mean, is as education with um, the private sector for people to kind of see the possibilities about what art can do. Um, and, and that is, it was, was the number one start with that and um and i kind of i feel like a little uh, a bee sometimes where i'll go to um public works or we don't uh, contract administration and i'll ask where that where the building is right now if, if it's a city structure for instance like where is that um for the project with f dot which i know well, let me let me finish that thought with with um, contract administration, and I will just ask like, where is where are we right now with that? Can you um, you know sink the floor? Can you do so such and such? So I'll see the plans, the renderings, what the needs are, and if if I can get the site prepped and, and easy, and I can get it timing so that hey, look, a cement truck just rolled up, and look, this artist has to have these. Uh, he wants to fill these forms. And it, so in other words, that's through with contract admin and kind of coordination with the construction of the site, like the artist, I'll back it up and the artist plans I know then needs to be done by X so that we can make sure that it's coordinated and um, uh, installed by Y. And then we need to, you know, those kind of things. So it's really on a case by case kind of, um, kind of thing. Oftentimes on some of them, like particularly with the lights on type of stuff, um, I'll have them be part of the committee and I'll pack that committee with people who know and can share with the developer or whomever the possibilities of what that can be so that it's not just me as a talking head doing a hard sell, but it's getting them to see um, what the possibilities are and oftentimes being educated by others um, helps a lot. Can, can I, I just follow up one question? I think it's just a little bit more of a detail. If you're if you have a project and you have a ceiling, a budget ceiling of uh, three hundred thousand uh -huh. um, dollars, but you're you're hoping that the project is really nine hundred thousand dollars. How does that? How do you do that? Do you do your call for artists for a three hundred thousand dollar project, and then do you? Are you able to escalate? Do you? I know at, at the University of South Florida they used to do that. They'd say, um, "Here's a ninety thousand dollar project, but I think I can get somebody to to use their money to make it a hundred and ninety thousand project or something like that." Yeah. But it still, there's, there's the requirement of of the uh, call for artists and what the, the budget is, and yet uh, you can you can seem to to go beyond that in some ways. How yeah. Do you, yeah, no, that's a good question. And how I'll, I'll do that. First of all, when I write the calls, I'll, I'll always have something in there that is a little squishy about the budget. I mean, if it's a because I'll say budget may adjust slightly or a budget is expected to adjust slightly. So that one, I want to make sure that the artist, I, you know, that we never present ourselves as inauthentic to the artist, but to give them a heads up that we know it, there's there's some wiggle room here. Um, and 
in the meantime, like why that call is, but, but before I even release the call, I have a good feeling about, or I, I've done some homework in regards to how this is going to play out. Like it's likely, uh, for instance, the, the call to artists for um, the gateway with F dot, that has not gone out yet because and I, I, I touch base with them on the phone like every three weeks because I, I want to find out where their contractor is, where's the money, what's how, how much likely. I, I don't want to tell an artist I've got a million dollars when I've got a, you know, half of that. Um, so I, 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 it, it's an issue of, of timing and, and finesse. Um, and on some of it, like with Lights on Tampa, when we throw out that call to artists for multiple sites, I have a We'll, we'll be crazy busy on the back end trying to find the money to make sure that we can make these projects be realized. Uh, and sometimes we don't. I mean, and we, in that case, we do that. We have to kind of prioritize them and say, well, we can fund up to this point. And if we can bring in an artist um, after, you know, if we have the money, then, then we'll bring in this other one, this other artist or whatever. But, but I think what's important to say is that I started out um, small and slow, um, basically just with uh, the, that in regards to the artworks in, you know, the, the percent for art projects um, in our own house, so to speak. Um, I'm trying to think of some, and, and of course I'll, I'll always do grants, like we've got some grants out and, um, pending now and that will kind of lead us in and I, I, we don't always do a call to artists in some cases it can be we, we have the ability to do um, a direct select or a invitational and it depends on the project in some cases whether we um uh you know it, and, and it could be a relatively large project, but for instance, if I, and I'm just trying to think of one example, let's say it's an environmental one and we know an artist, want, uh, I mean, the, the project really wants an artist to address stormwater. Well, I, there's only a couple of artists that I know who just will knock it out of the park on stormwater. And I kind of was, we, we'll call them all and ask them if I may present their work to um, the department and, and get kind of get them a sense about what they're thinking of because one that vision builds they get to see this incredible work these artists do and then they'll say yeah they want that and then that's where I start kind of the negotiation say well this artist it, you know you're going to need x amount for this to get to where you want it to be and then I'll kind of let them push it and, and go find the money and that's happened before like I had a meeting this week with um, solid waste they want to do something and I just kind of say, well, what, how much money do y'all have? And they said, well, we have 100,000. And I said, okay, well, there's some artists that do, you know, uh, recycle work and this, this, and this, and the ranges of these artists are, you know, X. And they said, oh, well, we might be able to find more money for that. So a lot of it is just kind of, you know, always advocating on the part of the, um, of the artist for what, what it can be. Because people, I mean, if you leave it up to some of them, they just, they just don't know. Or they just think it's a box to check and they don't realize what a difference it can make. Does you that help? have some specific yeah. questions that if you want to ask for those. Well, Robin, if I could jump in here. Um, you mentioned a, a word that kind of has resonated a lot. Um, under our current structure, we're um, uh, a municipal committee and we're bound by the sunshine laws. And I've always felt that it was kind of um, almost counterproductive and a bit of an irony because um, art really thrives on communication and we're really not allowed to talk to each other in, in, in many regards. And you mentioned that there was a 501c3, the Friends of uh, Tampa Public Art. Um, could you just give us a little, you know, I, if, if you would, had the possibility of maybe just sending us, you know, uh, their mission statement and, and charter just as a model, because uh, we did bring it up and we were told that um, the city cannot give money to uh, a nonprofit. But uh, do you know how uh, this group got around it or how it was organized to allow the 501c3 to coexist with the municipal, uh, you know, art committee? 
Yeah, and we, what we do is completely um, out there and, and open. One of the reasons, how it started, by the way, I think it, in 2001, maybe, or maybe 2000, I don't know, but it was, it's, it was a long time ago. Um, and somebody wanted to donate artwork to restore or donate money, excuse me, to restore an artwork. And the city didn't have a mechanism to do that. A lot of people don't want to give money to the city. If we're going to, and like with Lights on Tampa, for instance, where we will get hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations, um, we, they, they feel they want to give to a nonprofit. So we, of course, when, um, and it did, kind of depends on how the administrations feel with that. When we, um, our parks department has a 501c3, a lot of our um, departments do, they're again run separately, but what we do, like when we do a contract, then let's talk about that, how that kind of will shape out, is um, for some of our work, like like the, the bridges, okay, that's a good example, because Tico gave um, the 501c3 $300,000 to start off on, on the bridges. Um, and then in our, in our contract, of course, we say when it go, gets to portions of the payment structure, um, and actually the contract, the 501c3 always pays first and the city pays last. So we just break up the, the um, payment sections by like that. Uh, um, I'm, I'm hearing, sorry, I'm getting a little distracted with an echo, but uh, the makeup, and, and actually we don't even keep, keep it here, but I mean, the, the main person who manages it is um, my staff person who is amazing. And so that's another reason, I mean, where we do a lot of good stuff is that I've just got a really good team. She um, makes sure everything is, you know, up to snuff and all the forms are, are paid and so on. Our uh, chairman of Friends of Tampa Public Art is an, a, an attorney and they keep the records, they keep it all. So we just, and, and we of course are, go through everything with our city. At first there was a little discomfort when Mayor Iorio came in, but then they kind of looked at it, the legal team looked at it, says, well, there's nothing really, it's all, it's all transparent, it's all clean, it's all good. Um, it's not, a, it's not, a, not an issue. Um, like I said, Parks Department's got a 501c3, a couple of other organizations do. And the Parks Department, for instance, when they get donations of food and such to give to kids at the community center, that all goes through uh, Friends of Tampa Recreation. Um, I don't think it has any, even though we, we do keep the minutes and so on, it's not, I, I don't think it's an issue with the sunshine law. I mean, we're uh, in regards to the, the nonprofit and because um, we're, we're also within the sunshine and we just haven't, I don't know, it, it, it's not a problem when it gets, uh, as a matter of fact, it's a really useful tool when people sometimes um, think that something inappropriate is happening. It's just like, well, no, I mean, because it's everything's right out there. So it, it actually um, is has worked out well for us. Um, but but you're right, the 501c3 is not subject to that. And by the way, back up to that, uh, one reason it's not subject to it is because there is only one public art committee member um, who, is, who is an active public art committee member who's on the board of Friends of Tampa Public Art so that it's not ever in violation of uh, the sunshine. There are former public art committee members on there and a couple of other arts advocates are on there, but it's a tiny board and basically it serves as a fiscal agent. So it doesn't, it doesn't do any work. That's one reason that I think we kept our committee members together for you know some of them for so long. It, it just really does maintain the integrity of the process, which by the way, I also wanna back up and say, that's the big thing that um, our public art committee does is that, um, we do all that, a lot of that, um, the work in terms of, course, obviously, the staff, in terms of um, the meetings and setting that up and all that, but really, um, they're charged with maintaining the integrity of the process. So it's, it, you know, and they've come up with some really, really great suggestions that have helped me problem solve some things in regards to policy. Um, that's, that's really important. 
Does anybody else, Diane, do you have any comments or questions? Not that I can think of, she's covered everything, but is there anything on this list from Debbie or David or anybody no, else? Robin, is there a, a way that you could also um, maybe um, send us a copy of your um, your presentation today that we could share? Sure, sure, I could do that. Thank you. You took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> um, one thing I didn't answer that I see there was a question of um, from Miss Jennings is how do you handle unsolicited proposals? Mm-hmm. Um, there's two things I can mention to that. One is um, you can, if you want to, tell the, again, have, it, have, it, have a policy in that, that you will review unsolicited proposals um, once a quarter or whatever and have your committee kind of do that. But always have your, your ability to say no thank you in regards to, um, unless you really want it. I have found that taking unsolicited proposals usually ends up being more of a quagmire than people think they will be um, because there's just it's it's taking somebody else's vision and I've had people ask me and this one of my big things that I will say to them is is, is uh, when I get these unsolicited proposals I said we are not a granting agency you know we go through a different type of a process and and I don't want um our heart, our, our money, which we don't have a lot of, so I, I'm very, very frugal with it. I don't want to take money that the committee may have a vision for some other type of a project of significance for high visibility, high use value, all that kind of stuff. And then take the time, because it takes a lot of time to do an unsolicited proposal and um, money for something that unless it's uh, out of the park and everybody just feels like it is amazing and everybody in the world has to see it it's you know um so i'm i'm very the same also with gifts gifts um the, what we've done with gifts because there's i really try to discourage gifts um unless it, again it's something that we really want but we break it up and um the, the you know when it, whenever the we get the uh, proposals for gifts there, it, we uh, have a subcommittee. So the, of, of the public art committee and they come back with a recommendation of whether we should or should not accept. If they say we should accept and it exceeds the value that um, we need to for it to go to city council for acceptance, we prepare that paperwork and send it to city council for acceptance. Um, so we're just very um, cautious about that because the thing is with the donations, one, oftentimes you'll get a uh, request for people wanting to donate one because it, it's, they want to be in your collection because it helps their resume or um, it is, uh, you're going to be stuck maintaining it and that's going to be an expense. Do you have the storage space for it? So there's all those issues that just, um, I think the vision needs to be kind of for what a, if you're building a holistic collection, your public art committee will be able to kind of shape that and say, no, that's not going to be within our vision or it's just way out there. It makes no sense or whatever those causes are, but it just gives you an ax you get, have an avenue to get out of it and to say, no, that's the biggest thing. Robin, how does um, your uh, public art committee decide on locations for projects? Is that kind of like the first step of, you know, where are you going to put a project and then come up with, you know, the ideas of, of what type of project you want to do? Well, location? How does that work? Um, that's a good, that's a really good question. There's, there's a, there's a lot to that. And typically, for instance, I mean, I'll give you the, the standard, like, it's a percent for art project out of, um, and the uh, fund sources coming out of a uh, new community center. Okay. Um, we'll have a meeting with um, all those entities, all those agencies or, or the uh, stakeholders, okay? So whether it's parks or in contract admin and a community person. So it, we, we make up a committee accordingly and kind of collectively go with where those opportunities make sense. Um, it is, in, in some cases, um, I will go to the public art committee because somebody has said something to me, whether it is um, internally or 
the mayor or whomever and I will say, what do y'all think of, I mean, this location on the river walk has come up, there's been a request. And um, so that's one way. So sometimes a location is presented to them and they say, yeah, we're, we're, we're in, that's great. Or it's like, no, I think funds can be better used X or we need to do that. Or this is a complication here. You know, um, if it's because it's, it conflicts visually with X or whatever. Um, but the locations are usually, rarely do they, are they in a position to see, I mean, unless it's like a, a site, it, it, rarely are, do we go out and, because we don't do it as, as, as the program is the thing and put something in um, a plaza. Like we want to go, because we just don't have that. I mean, you guys might have kind of a different, um, kind of a landscape and situation for that. And you know where there's a really good location and that makes sense, you know? Um, so it, it just kind of depends. Okay. And then um, we have some sites that kind of are, we would love to put some artwork. However, it's kind of more county property. Uh -huh. um, so like along like the Pinellas Trail and things like that. So how does Tampa ha handle that? Oh, well, you can do that. With, yeah, you can do that with an agreement. Um, and we've done that plenty where you want, you know, and it can just be that you'll maintain it and you just want to have access, you know, in, in the agreement that you'll have access to uh, to get to it and to maintain it and that you can, um, it, it, that's just a memorandum of understanding. And that's very similar to what we do with, um, with FDOT, for instance, when we do projects with them and it is not on, I mean, it's their property clearly. Um, so we have to jump through a lot of hoops with that, with them. But again, if, if we have the resources and they are, um, all the stars align, it's, it's worth it. Uh, but yeah, typically like if you see on the Pinellas Trail is a great, is a great example and a, and a really good idea. And, and that might be because also um, Pinellas County I, I don't know the relationship, but that seems like a really good opportunity to partner with some of the um, things that Pinellas County does. Uh, unfortunately, our Hillsborough County here has a really, uh, not a strong program. It's just kind of tucked away and it's, hopefully they'll they'll come out of their shell soon and be able to, to do some good stuff. But, um, they, what we do instead is that we, we work with other entities within the county. Like I work um, with one of it, you know, Tampa Bay History Center. I'm working on an African-American heritage trail with them and they're gonna do all this other stuff outside in the county. And then it's kind of like, okay, when you get to the city, that's the point of connection and plug in. And our division runs, goes, goes there within the, and manages, brings in the artists and such for the, uh, for the city. Uh, and then one more thing, uh, have you done, has Tampa done any water projects, art projects? Yes, um, we did one for lights on. And again, the, the beautiful thing about temporary projects is that they can fail and you can still hold your head up high because you tried. <laughs> and, and by that, I mean, like we did a, um, a light installation uh, under, under water and it was, it was nice, it was great but it was not smart for it to be a permanent installation. Um, the, it, between the water and the boats and the traffic and, uh, and such. So that was kind of a, there were a, a lot of headaches there. I was glad to see it go, um, but it was nice while it was there. It was a great ambiance. People loved it. And again, it really showed possibilities. Uh, we've done, the, the bridge lighting is about all we've done on the water. We have had lots of requests. Some people it would, would love to do, have us do something in a retention pond, which could be a possibility. We did look at also, and COVID killed it for us, you know, thank you COVID, but it was, um, we're doing a waterborne art parade, which we still want to do because we've got the, we, we've got the partners and it was all lined up and it was great to have this kind of like flotilla all go all the way up the river and we still want to do that and have it as an artist parade and how inspiring and fun and wacky could that be so that's still kind of in, in the back pocket that i think we'll we'll get back to that i mean like i said it was all lined up ready to go we had the artist even come down and do some um 
do a test and then COVID hit. So that was January. And of course we're closed up in March. So, um, but anyway, water for that, we, and I'm sure you guys know, could, didn't, th there's the regulations with um, Army Corps of Engineers and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's kind of a pain, but it's really nice if somebody else will fight that battle for you and you just bring in the artwork. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, Robin, again, our profuse and sincere thank you for uh, sharing your time and expertise with us. It's most appreciative. And I know personally, I learned an awful lot. Uh, got some great ideas from you. So thank you yet again. Oh, my pleasure indeed. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure. I really do love Tarpon Springs. It's, it's a wonderful community. So um, thank you. It's a great opportunity to, to talk to you guys. Thanks again, Thanks. Robin. And hopefully you'll find a way to come up for a great Greek lunch one of these days. Yeah. Oh, I would love that. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Anytime right. your schedule allows, just let us know. Right. I will do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. So you all thought that was worth a while? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Good. That was. She was just wonderful. It was. Uh, Quite interesting how we had a person on a bicycle talking to us for the last. <laughs> no, time. I know. I saw that too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a warble. But yes. <laughs> well, I think it validates a lot of things that we've been kicking around here over the past, you know, six mm -hmm. months to a year. Um, right. It, it sounds like we really need to look at that ordinance. And Definitely. And also, um, you know, the longevity and the th time it's taken to develop it, you know, kind of thing, and. I think Tampa also, you know, they have a dedicated staff. I mean, it's not a big staff, but it, they're dedicated to the public art and everything, uh, given the time. Yeah, so, I gather there are two. There's Robin and yeah, think, a staff, yeah. person, another mm -hmm. paid staff person. Also, you know, having lived and worked in downtown Tampa for so many years and knowing, you know, with the Strath Center anyway and how the partnerships and everything go, you know, it, it's interesting because she does have so much more to tap into, mm -hmm. you know, down there with, and, you know, all those businesses and all those corporations have a vested interest in looking good to right. the city by ponying up money, you know, and stuff like that. You know, uh, with the size of Tarpon Springs, you know, we don't have that, those corporate people that we can rely on, to, you know, right. trust me, yeah. I've tried a lot, you know, just for Tarpon Arts, but um, yeah, so it, there's a big, you know, difference there in what we can. Right, well, even the know. physical architecture, you know, you look at their, you know, the walls they have available for murals or the lighting projects and, you know, they lit the bridges. We have Beckett Bridge, I mean, what else are we going to light up? You know, <laughs> you know so uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we have, different assets and different prob you know, problems, you know, Lucianne? I was struck by how dependent a lot of those projects are on an urban mm -hmm. landscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one thing though that we do have and that she seems to be really um, in the flow of, she seems to be in on the ground floor on infrastructure and Tarpon Springs does have an infrastructure budget, capital budget, which is sizable and, and renewed on a regular basis mm -hmm. with a penny for Pinellas and now all the various federal and state grants that are available um, tied to sustainability and climate change. So that's an advantage we can work uh, right. with other city departments to be in on the ground floor. and you know she made that very clear mm -hmm. and that's how a lot of that funding is leveraged too which is yeah. so we can do that we can do that mm -hmm. but you do have to watch the funds that you do have and the fees that you can collect because mm -hmm. they've got to be really they, they can be frittered away and eroded away is a better way to say it by trying to do things that that you know instead of keeping the eye on the the larger big stuff bigger mm -hmm. projects that that are much more meaningful mm -hmm. um absolutely good point okay um 
and and the whole nonprofit, as far as a support, I mean, they're providing the majority of the funding that's coming to this, as opposed to from from the government side, the municipal side. So I think that's a critical element that we need to talk about, or somebody needs to, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sounded to me like what she was talking about is that the funds are all separate. And so it's like once a contract is done, it's like, okay, it says how much money is coming from the city, how much is coming from this nonprofit, and then any other the outside other sources or, yeah. or donations. So it's all transparent, but it's also delineated as to who's paying for what. But do we know? have the structure to be able to manipulate that as a board if we have a project i mean could we take a a project and advertise it for this and then as we're negotiating with that artist go to somebody else and put something else on top of that uh, or is it or are we really locked into certain funds you know well the public art fund is you know the primary source of us yeah. doing any projects but Think it would have to be looked at a little bit more about you know the nonprofit side or you know how partnerships I'm, would be yeah uh, you know no, I'm, I'm just thinking how how we're not even mentioned in the, the you know in, in a lot of the stuff here and that, that we're we're sort of secondary and it's it's we're always sort of here's a place that you could make art in or something like that or here's here's your limited budgets and how do we go about getting bigger budgets and um and ex extending the the range of what we do and that's what what they do there and and she's done it for 30 some odd years or something like that's from what she says and uh, and i do know the infrastructure there like like you do you know in, in tampa there there is a lot of people that are are engaged in all this kind of stuff and uh, she's able to work with uh you know and this is not even half of what goes on in tampa you know the whole airport thing and all that kind of stuff is is totally different but right. they're involved in it uh, in some ways they're they're involved in the process but um the uh just to to be able to enable starts i mean their relationship with the university of south florida or with with vinick for instance i mean i think these are things that, that you know, we really don't have here, you know, right. I mean, it, it's, it's a different league. I mean, they're, they're, and they're not even major league, you know, in, right. in this thing. I mean, they're, they're a minor league in this, but they know how to play it and they've, they've learned how to play it. And, uh, um, you know, and, and each city is a little bit different. St. Peter's a different way of going about this than, sure. than Tampa does. And, uh, um, St. Pete doesn't have the infrastructure that, that, Tampa has, and yet, and Tarpon doesn't have the infrastructure that any of them have. What do we have? Mm -hmm. You know, we do have the bike path. We do have the bayous. We mm -hmm. do have. I mean, we don't really have any open land. We're not <laughs> really doing any major development. That that. Well, funny you should that, uh, mention that because um, when the topic of uh, you know that sculpture that Mike Elwell brought to our attention was turned down because of our budgetary concerns. Um, I sent an email to Mark Lacoris, the city manager who kicked it over to Kev Kevin Powell, the building development director. And I just got, yesterday I got a response uh, as to what we can anticipate being in the pipeline. Okay, uh, Pioneer Homes, uh, I, I gather from this is that the, uh, the public art, uh, funding kicks in upon the building permit applications. Um, Pioneer Homes, no building permits applied for. Flagship Bank, interesting, is under a million dollars. Uh, Dan's Car Wash indicates on their TRC application that they paid the fund and the amount should be on their permit. So again, I think at the next meeting, we should probably have a budget review. Uh, the car wash on the corner of US 19 and Klosterman is not in the city limits. Interestingly enough, I wasn't sure about that. Uh, the city clerk's office, no building permits have been applied for yet, but that might be interesting to consider for an artwork. Um, Eagle Ridge, that's, or Eagle Creek, excuse me. Those are the, the new housing projects on Klosterman 
they've paid $13,365 into the public art fund. 13,000? $13, $13,365, it seems very low. It does. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I asked if there were any others that you know weren't on my list and um, the calculated fee for Furman Volvo is $24,474.53, which was paid. And the Holiday Inn Express is in the process of uh, permits and medals. Can I, can I forward this email to, the, to you to send to the PAC? Sure. Okay. Um, and then we should probably close this and then, you know, discuss it at the April, any right. further at the April meeting. Okay. Um, just to uh, keep with protocol, oh, to Luciana, I'm sorry. Just a couple of quick comments. Even without a 501c3, being a city entity, we can always apply for grants from the NEA. So it's, mm -hmm. even though the public art fund is our major source, we can always look for matches as we exist now. Right, I have um, a big asterisk next to NEA. So that's yeah. something that we should explore, absolutely. And I guess any comments on what you just read us are best left for the meeting or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, I think we need a uh, an art fund budget update. And yeah, I'm gonna need that fine. anyway, because we have our annual presentation sometime in May, I believe it's gonna be on the agenda. Tomorrow's April, so. Um, Okay, I guess I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Bill, second. Uh, meeting is adjourned at 11.21 a.m. <laughs>